Good to go. Good morning. <clears throat> it's always good to have um, a panel right at the beginning because then the rooms are still full and there's still lots of excitement and people are not too exhausted yet from the uh, um, ongoing discussions. And of course, the topic that we have is a very uh, exciting one, reshaping the ASEAN economy through digital innovation. Now everything is digital. I mean, you go from one uh, room to another and it's somehow it's all digital. Um, and, uh, but obviously digital is, is the name of the game at the moment. Still, I think uh, lots of challenges, lots of opportunities. And um, we have um, you know, a very interesting panel uh, this morning uh, with Sigma Brecker, the um, President and Chief Executive Officer of Telenor, uh, with lots of activities uh, also here in the region. Uh, Yasmin Mahmoud, uh, the Chief Executive Officer of the Malaysia Digital Economy Corporation. Uh, Nick Nash, um, the Group President of Garina. Uh, Singapore, but with activities across the whole region. And, uh, and then uh, Emir Sattar, chairman of Matahari uh, Mall from Indonesia. And usually I forget to introduce myself. I'm Hans Perbergner, the global chairman of the Boston Consulting Group and uh, the moderator uh, today. So everybody talks about the digital uh, economy, digital innovation. Um, there are lots of estimates, you know, how fast it will grow. Um, and um, uh, Temasek and, and Google came out with the, with the estimate that uh, it will grow from uh, 30 billion last year to uh, 200 uh, billion in 2025. I'm sure in 2025 nobody will look back, you know, we'll just en enjoy a very large market. Um, and I think clearly uh, there are enormous benefits uh, uh, with the digital economy and digitization overall, but there are also a lot of anxieties, certainly more in the developed markets where they worry about jobs being destroyed and, and people will get displaced by, by robots or machines more general. Um, I think what, what we would like today to talk about, obviously the opportunities here in, uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, how um, the economies will change, how people's lives will change, um, and, um, and in particular focus on, on two aspects. One, of course, is the policy aspect. What are uh, the, uh, the key challenges for policies, not just by country, but across the region. Uh, where are the, uh, the obstacles and, and how uh, difficult is it really to operate across the region? And what is needed in order to really improve that? Uh, that's what's one part. Um, and, and then the second part, um, while we already have in Southeast Asia, uh, you know, many, many people having access um, to, uh, uh, to the digital economy in one way or the other are being affected. How can we make sure that it really covers essentially over the next five, 10 years, you know, the 600 million plus people in the region? And I would say, you know, with the, uh, the people we have here in the panel, I mean, the players, uh, I think you all play a very important role in, in making that work. So let's uh, start with the policy issues. Um, and, um, you know, clearly there is, everybody talks about is imperative to really advance the digital economy, to advance digitization overall. But how easy is it, you know, to really make this work across the region? What are the obstacles? And, um, you know, also what you have to do within your organization in order to, to make it work. Uh, and I would like to start with you, Yasmin, um, to, uh, to uh, uh, really, you know, uh, when, when you, uh, did your work uh, um, last year, you talked about uh, only 6% of the Malaysian companies really have aligned their, their overall strategy with the digital uh, economy and, and digitization. You know, how can you encourage uh, companies, but also the overall economy more to, to embrace the opportunities? Thank you, Hans. Um, first of all, I want to just apologize. This is really a bad time to get a sore throat and to be losing my voice, but I will try my very best. Um, before I answer your question specifically, Hans, let me just provide some context about the opportunity of the digital economy for each country in the region. Malaysia, for instance, we have, we have embarked on this journey 20 years ago. 
um, exactly 20 years ago, if you recall through the inception of the Malaysia uh, Multimedia Super Corridor, which was really about uh, very much a real estate play of creating this uh, physical uh, location to attract the best companies in the world and in Malaysia to invest in, to set up and do business. It was really an investment attraction uh, perspective. If you fast track over 20 years, uh, the investments have been pretty substantial to the to the to the region of uh, 283 billion ringgit, 80 billion US dollars, 3,000 uh, more than close to 4,000 companies, creating 160,000 of high income jobs, 2.5 times that of the national average. So from that context, it has been it has reached the the, the original objective. But there are two aspects of it that really needs to be um, looked at. The 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 second as the second part is about adoption. While this, all this, um, the, the Amity Super Corridor, the MSC, um, has reached its objectives to, to the certain extent from an investment attraction perspective uh, and has contributed uh, to a GDP uh, contribution for the IT sector of about 17%. But what's really lacking and what needs to be addressed is really about the impact of digital innovation on the rest of the traditional businesses. And adoption, Hans, as you mentioned, we had a survey done, and um, uh, only 63% only 63 of our companies are at this stage of digital explorer, which means that they do understand, they do realize the importance of digital uh, transformation, but it is still being done at the fringes. It's not being embedded into the overall strategy of the organization. Now, what is, what is stopping it? And, and, and and it's a segue to what you mentioned around policy. Now, no matter how you define digital economy, the, the, how to make it happen would be um, across, I would say, two enabling uh, components and perhaps two more of what I would call catalytic uh, components. Now, government and policy plays an important role. However, I firmly believe that the digital innovation and the four, the four IR is really going to be driven by the business and primarily driven by the millennials. And this is what the policy, the two catalytic, uh, 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 the, the two enabling policy that governments across the region, across the world, have to really put emphasis on is around how do we leverage on the fact that ASEAN, 40% of our population are below 30, 30 years old. And that is unique. That is, we don't have an aging population to be disrupted. Uh, well, they, they will be to an extent, but uh, by and large, the younger population would be the ones that will be uh, creating this innovation. And, uh, uh, and, and what we have to do is to really make sure that education system, government's policy is around producing the talent, uh, the talent uh, workforce for our, uh, for, you know, to, to participate in this uh, uh, innovation economy. Now, when you talk about talent, the most important part of it is to look at the grassroots level and uh, schools. Uh, Education system in most of ASEAN is really very uh, centralized. Um, and um, one of the things that Malaysia is looking at is overall looking at STEM education, but also most important part that what we can do is to really leapfrog, leapfrog our education system um, you know, because we don't have the legacies. And one of the things that we are trying to do in Malaysia, and I say we are trying to do, because we have the policy framework, and Hans, I think this is also a good example of where the policy framework exists, but execution is also very key. Intr introducing coding and computer science in schools is something that Malaysia has embraced. We have piloted it last year, and this, this year and ongoing for, next, for, for the coming years, it is going to be executed uh, as part of the curriculum law and embedding it in the curriculum. And we have had some amazing success stories, um, you know, uh, uh, early success stories of kids who are really just embracing this. We have digital people who are digital natives, but they are mostly now uh, digital consumers. And what do we have to do? What, what we have to do now is to ensure that they are turned into digital producers as opposed to just consumers. And the policy framework needs to be in place to allow that to be executed. Very good. Sigwe, I would like to turn to you now and uh, both, of course, externally you have to deal with, with policies, but also when you transform uh, Telenor, you know, how do policies uh, 
you know, enable you or prevent you from, from making the, the transformations, both on the customer side but also internally? Well, knowing that this is a, a discussion, I, I think I want to provoke a little bit more. Uh, Absolutely. And uh, Jasmine was not very optimistic. I'm a little bit more pessimistic in this area. Uh, because I, I see uh, a risk that ASEAN is actually losing out uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, I think the, the ASEAN population is running way ahead uh, of the governments. Take one example. We entered Myanmar uh, 15 months ago, a country with absolutely no connectivity, no digital content, nothing. 15 months thereafter, uh, we have 15 million customers, uh, and 60% of them are using internet. So they leapfrogged from absolutely nothing to almost the same as uh, Singapore customers are, are, are using in 15 months. Uh, we see a customer in Myanmar now being very similar to a customer in Kuala Lumpur or in Bangkok, even Norway. So what is happening is that the the, uh, the uh, uptake of these digital services is going so fast, and it's actually ta uh, um, taking away the borders between these different nations. The, the, the customer's demand is driving in a direction which uh, the, the governments are not following. Uh, at the same time, we see now that digital development, digital innovation, is happening uh, in, in the two bigger uh, Asian countries, China and in the uh, ecosystem around Alibaba or in India, not in ASEAN. Why, for example, why is it so that uh, most of the e-commerce in Malaysia is owned by European or American uh, investors? Why is it so that Uber, an American company, is not competing with the taxi industry? Why is it so that Airbnb, also an American-based company, is coming in? I don't see any of the ASEAN uh, companies or the developments are taking a part of this. So I'm afraid that, that ASEAN is losing out. What we need, we need uh, the governments to get together to harmonize regulations and policies. And I think there is lessons to be learned from the European Union here. The European Union, now the regulators, have agreed to make one uh, digital framework across Europe. Uh, you also need to not only harmonize, you also need to liberalize. We cannot deal with different uh, uh, foreign ownership rules in different ASEAN countries, different regulations, different way of working. It's just too complicated. This needs to be harmonized. Uh, and, and I think too many governments are talking about uh, using two big words about the digital opportunities, but I don't see the action. So, so uh, on this part, you need to get together uh, relatively soon. Uh, and then I think also that the young population you have in the ASEAN countries it's, it's, and the innovation drive you have in these countries uh, makes this an opportunity. So in addition to the policy framework, there is also an opportunity to develop some of these uh, uh, ecosystems that could foster more startups in ASEAN. If I take one, some few years in the future, the, the, digital, uh, the, the demand for digital services is not only going to be the messaging services that, that you are doing or the Facebooks of the world. It's going to be much more local relevant content. Uh, for example, uh, content for the farmers to take away the middlemen uh, to be middlemen and trying to sell their products directly to the world market. Education is another example. Uh, cashless economy based on digital uh, uh, financial transactions. Uh, and I, I can mention quite a few of them. Most of this will be local relevant content. Uh, and that local relevant content should be developed by, by the local communities uh, or by ASEAN in this example. So my, my urge to, to the Asian governments on the policy area is to get your act together. The sooner the better. And if you do, there's a great opportunity for you to actually be a part of this revolution that is not coming. And it's happening extremely fast. Uh, and, I, and, and I don't think that people really know how, how quickly this happens. And there are positions to be taken here in ASEAN, uh, positions that, that already are taken in, in the, the more developed part of, of Europe, for example, or in, in, in the US. And there is great opportunities for ASEAN companies, ASEAN governments, to really be in charge of, of, uh, of uh, the digital future. Very good. Um. So this was the, the outside in view, of course, from somebody who is also working inside. Um, uh, Emi, you, you, are, you are focusing on uh, you know, Indonesia at the moment still. Um, you know, 
do you take a different perspective from, from SIGWA or do you, you, you broadly share this? And <laughs> what would you like governments to do? And we said, you know, let's not try to be, you know, nice, but really uh, put um, the fingers in the, in the wounds where, wherever possible. Well, uh, I think it's interesting about, about uh, people from so-called outside seeing, seeing ASEAN, which is you are probably know because you have a business here also. But uh, I, I still think, uh, basically, yes, uh, ASEAN, uh, we're so-called, those are the challenges. I mean, in this morning, in the plenary, we heard from the panelists, uh, the silo is there. Uh, we've launched this, what we call ASEAN Economic Community, you know, the free flow, good service, and talent, whether it works mm -hmm. or not, you know. So, uh, so, so it's a, a challenge. But from my perspective, basically, you know, you, your first question is about, uh, in our business, um, we don't go outside of Indonesia yet because uh, we launched this e-commerce. Uh, practically, the market is in Indonesia, you know, uh, basically. Population base is Indonesia. Uh, I mean, some uh, people say they got China, India, and then the next is Indonesia. So, so for us, it doesn't make sense due to the, for us to go to the ASEAN yet, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so going back to what the government is doing, I have to say, you know, uh, the current government of, of Indonesia, especially uh, our President Jokowi, you know, I mean, he's, he's, he's very bullish in this thing. And of course, uh, he, he's really making sure that everything is in place, in fact, uh, um, Connectivity is, is, is an issue. Uh, basically, the government uh, has this plan to connect uh, what they call this Palapa project, and then we're, we're looking at this also, but by 2018, you know, all the broadband fiber optics will be connected to, they've got 500 what they call uh, smart desa. Uh, desa is a village, small village, you know. So, uh, all the plans are there. Uh, I think what we have to see is the realization. We basically it's going to happen or not. Uh, I'm quite optimist you know, about about this uh, in terms of looking at this where we are, and 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 I see that uh, because uh, we, we've we've seen. You know, basically this transformation from the traditional into the, to the digital is basically, uh, we, we have to see whether the business community does it and the regulators support it. We've seen uh, uh, in you know, several occasions where, I mean, this case with, with Uber and the traditional taxi, basically, you know, there was a big demonstration and everything. But at the end of the day, you know, uh, the government basically put in and, and support this 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 uber you know uh so uh, so i think uh, it's it's going to be there i mean we're uh, i'm i'm quite uh, optimist otherwise why invest uh our business because our business in the matahari you know we've got 142 uh, 142 so called um outlets in indonesia where this year we we're, we're going to open more than than almost 10 outlets again you know and we are building this one also because we, we see that uh, this is the future, and and we see that uh, that basically uh, if we're not we don't start, basically, and the market is still big. So, so I you know kind of have a, have a but but it's good to hear the comments about this, which is uh, good for our government also to see and good for ASEAN basically because I I don't see only Indonesia I see ASEAN because. From where I, I was before, you know, I was uh, running an airline. I mean, getting approvals from, you know, just from uh, each country. You, it's not like if you go to EU, you just go to Brussels and you get everything. Uh, but, but here, you know, you have to go to Singapore, you have to go to Kuala Lumpur, you have to go all, all to get these things. So, so that's the challenge, I think, what, what uh, the ASEAN, I would say the Secretary General, basically, are they going to give more empowerment to the Secretary General to, to solve these things, you know. So that's very good. Mm -hmm. so, Nick, you're operating across the Southeast Asia and ASEAN, and when we talked beforehand, you talked about how 
difficult it is really to make this work. You know, maybe you share your view about the policies, the obstacles, sure. uh, and what you would like to see uh, to be changed. No, thank, thank you very much. Um, it, it's a pleasure to be here, and nice to see so many friends in the audience as well. I, I'll start by saying something that, that may be a little provocative, but I think it's very important to say. For many years, Southeast Asia has had an insecurity complex relative to China and India and the West. And I think the time for that is coming to an end. And the reason I say that is for the very first time, we're beginning to see indigenous, homegrown technology and mobile companies in this region succeeding in a very fantastic way. And I don't in any way mean to put our particular company on the pedestal, but to use us as an example of the challenges and the opportunities, our business was founded in, in 2009 by a, a group of, of friends that had known each other for a long time. It took us $17 million, just $17 million, to reach break even, and today our business is worth about $4 billion. Uh, that's over a brief span of six years. And the way we did that was by systematically building highly localized services and products for each of the major economies of Southeast Asia, and so to speak, connecting those dots together in a unified platform. That turns out to be a winning formula for Southeast Asia. So on the one hand, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply appreciative, Sigve, of your comments around the proverbial kick in the pants that Southeast Asia needs, but there are a few rays of light that I think we need to emulate and copy. Uh, in our particular business, we began by launching a chat platform, which then morphed into a game platform, which then added a fintech business, and then added an e-commerce business. And to give you an illustration of how dynamic and I think how exciting Southeast Asia can be, there's never been a company in China or in India that's gone from zero to about a billion dollars of GMV throughput in e-commerce in a single year. Yesterday was our one-year anniversary for our e-commerce business. We hit a billion dollars of GMV annualized in a single year. So I'm proud of what Southeast Asia can actually accomplish. There really is strong potential here if we build it the right way. But from a public policy standpoint, uh, I would point out three things that I think we have gotten right in Southeast Asia, in certain parts of, not always everywhere, and two very specific things we have to do better on a going forward basis. First, from an education standpoint, Southeast Asia is actually much better educated than many outside of the region appreciate. Singapore has some fantastic universities. Certainly, Thailand has Chula and Tamasat. Indonesia has Bay, has, has, has Ui and has Itaibay, Bay, and the list goes on from there. We actually are improving on a human capital standpoint. And in particular, I put Singapore on a pedestal because they've created a bit of a university melting pot where some of the brightest students from the region come and study and then build social networks, build connectivity, and then become fantastic employees for companies like ours that want to build in every region. So I think that, that is definitely a, a strong check mark. The second thing is certain countries in this region, but unfortunately not all, have been very forward leaning on their telecommunications policy. And the example I love to use is Vietnam. Where just a couple of years back, you could buy an unlimited 3G plan for three or four dollars a month a fraction of what it costs in the US, a fraction of what it costs in Indonesia. That has led to an explosion in mobile users and internet users more broadly in places like that. And it's testament how a lower income country can get this policy right and build the foundation for a lot of growth. And then lastly, I, I think I have a lot of you know, kind words and a lot of time for the ASEAN Free Trade Agreement. Getting together and building the consensus for that is definitely helping all of us that are doing e-commerce across the region. So that's, that's the good news, and I think a, a, a ray of optimism that this thing can be done properly. There are two things we've got to work on in the next three years. The first is the concept of mobile money or e-money licenses. And to sort of demystify this, all this is is if someone has cash in their wallet or cash in their bank account, and they want to pay for something on an e-commerce website, let them have a wallet as an intermediary. There's nothing terribly controversial or sensitive about that. There's no lending involved. There's nothing from a national security uh, dynamic involved. Yet it's impossible for a foreign company to get an e-money license in Indonesia. There are many Singaporean companies that have been 18 months in line, and at the end of the day, we all recognize it's less about their qualifications, it's more about the dynamic of foreign versus domestic company. That's an obvious enabling technology that can 10x the size of e-commerce, simply letting people spend the money they already have worked hard to earn, but to do it digitally as opposed to in an analog fashion. That has to be fixed. And then secondly, I'd, I'd point out something which I think is very, very important. <laughs> We've had 50 or 60 years post-World War II with a general reduction in tariffs on a global basis. And free trade agreements and the World Trade Organization and others have done a marvelous job of this. But that's a solution for an agricultural and industrial world. I raise a sheep, 
you shear the sheep, you dye the wool, you make the sweater, you sell it at a Matahari Mall. That's a fantastic business and, and, a, and a public policy imperative mm -hmm. for a goods-oriented world. But what if I build a software application? I don't export that to a bottler in Malaysia or in Thailand. I don't have a local partner that takes and adds the final finishing touch to a website or to a mobile app. What we need now is not just the free flow of goods and services, we need the free flow of management and of day-to-day -day KPI monitoring and day-to-day -day involvement in the business. And for that to work, there's a simple solution, which is liberalization of foreign ownership limits in countries in ASEAN. We should pick five or 10 industries that are uncontroversial, not national security, not land, other things. E-commerce is a lovely example. And let companies own 51% or even 100% of their local subsidiaries, because if the software is built in any one city, it has to be exported across the region. Yeah. So you wanted to chime in here? No, this is exactly what I also talk about uh, when, I, when I mentioned the harmonization and the liberalization. A low foreign ownership, which is the spirit of the, uh, the, uh, the ASEAN uh, agreement anyway. But, but so far, people are not implementing it. Uh, all the, the uh, credit to, to Malaysia that actually have, uh, that has changed the foreign ownership, at least in the telecom sector. So, so let, 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 let uh, this be liberalized uh, in sectors which I don't see any security reasons for protecting. Uh, um, and secondly, uh, also try to harmonize such that people like, uh, like Nicker don't have to spend a lot of time with, with uh, doing things differently in all the different markets. It could be do, done in one, one platform. That's the only way you can build scale enough. Uh, and then I will also then expand that not only in, not only in, in the sector we are currently operating, telecom sector, but, but banking. And if you really want to have a digital inclusion, you need to have financial inclusion. And the only way you can do that is to, is to take the informal banking sector into a more formal sector. And the only way you can do that is through a digital cashless uh, economy. Uh, and, and, and let new players do that. Uh, and I, again, I don't see any... any and the downside of it, I I'd only see an upside of, of actually doing that. But, but, and then I can go sector by sector. So this is not only telecom regulation or banking regulation, it's also within education, for example, or health is another example. And what digital inclusion really means is that every services that you can get if you live in, in Singapore or in Kuala Lumpur or in, in um, Jakarta should be possible to deliver on digital platforms out in the mass markets. That's the beauty of, of digital inclusion. But to do so, you need to let new players be allowed to be a part of that, uh, that yeah. uh, business. Very good. I mean, if, if actually, I could just add to sorry, that for just 30 please. seconds. This is a bit of a cliche, but you know, everyone knows the analogy of how when the California gold rush happened in the 19th century, the only lasting businesses that came out of that were the guys that sold blue jeans, which is Levi Strauss, and the guys that sold picks and shovels. And I think what we need to do in a bit of a cliche way, but in an important one, is divide industries between those that are the gold and those are the picks and shovels. Let the gold be owned locally, but if someone has a better idea for a shovel, let that be foreign, because it simply enables the domestic business yeah, to be more successful. Good. That's a good point, <laughs> yeah. very good. Well, I, you know, I think building on, on, on what you said, I mean, inclusiveness and, and how can we create uh, even more access and ensure access, not just as consumers, but also as entrepreneurs. I think this is the other part. We always talk about inclusiveness and the thing, you know, you're on the receiving end, but how can you be on the giving end? And, and how can we make sure that, you know, the, the market, you know, that we have now 260 million users, how can we extend this to all the people, 600 million plus people in the, in the region? And again, I would like to start with you, Jasmine, you know, uh, and we talked before about, you know, how do you ensure digital inclusivity? Um. <coughs> I think one of the key elements, I mean, you, again, I want to go back to the fact that we have got this enabling uh, components as well as catalytic components. And inc inclusiveness uh, if in education, I've, I've touched on that. I also want to touch a bit about connectivity. Although, um, you know, Nick, you mentioned about there are certain spots, and this is really the story of ASEAN. There are bright spots, but it has to be consistently. What can we bring up to be consistently embraced and consistently driven in a cohesive manner ASEAN-wide. Um, and um, I want to touch about connectivity because there is a bit of a dichotomy in, um, in ASEAN when it comes to connectivity. We have got the outliers such as Singapore uh, who has got 100% access because it is a small island and it is uh, 122 megabit per second 
in speed because when it comes to connectivity, it's always about speed and access. Now, in countries like Malaysia, despite us starting this journey 20 years ago, knowing connectivity and infrastructure is the most important component, we have in a way lagged behind. We are at 7.3 average download speed in Malaysia at 7.3 meg per second when the global average is 23 meg per second. And this is something that I think people who are like Vietnam, you mentioned about Vietnam, who is really leapfrogging, but Malaysia leapfrogged 20 years ago, but where have we, where, where are we now, 20 years later, in a very critical component? It is like in the digital economy, connectivity is like electricity, right? I mean, you've got to have the electricity in the house that is really high broadband speed and high capacity. And then you have to have the batteries on the go. So you have the fixed broadband and you have the mobile broadband. And the fact that Malaysia has, has um, you know, it's a di dichotomy, it's about access versus speed. And in Malaysia, because of the fact that access has been put as priority and the policy framework, regulatory framework, is one that prioritizes access over speed, is what's been, uh, which is, which is, has been, what has been, uh, uh, you know, hindering us. So in a way, inclusivity is important because it is, uh, it is driven by the braininess of our people, yet we've got to make sure that the, it's not marginalizing to the people in the urban area, um, you know, sorry, people in the, in rural, the, rural, in the yeah. rural areas. So, uh, you know, inclusivity, yes, but also there are the perils of inclusivity, and how do governments find the balance between these two, not only in the area of connectivity, in education, how do you give the best of the education to the best brains in the, you know, to, 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 to the halves of the country, but how do you also ensure that there is the gap doesn't widen to the have-nots? So this dichotomy is a policy, the, the policy balancing that government have to really do it right. And you make it right, the unleashing of the, 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 the power in ASEAN is going to be really maximized. And if we get it wrong, 10 years later, We'll see, 10 years, fast forward 10 years, and we'll see which countries have got it right and which countries have got it not so right. And more importantly, ASEAN, really, is it really something that can be as powerful as the EU? We heard in this morning's plenary the fact that ASEAN Secretariat only has got a 15 million US dollar budget, which is a surprise to me as well, whereas the EU has something like 150 million or something? 150 million uh, years on Probably the larger and, and probably everybody is criticizing them for that. You know, I'm not sure whether <laughs> so that's a really good so role bright model. It's not so either you know. <laughs> on that side, yes. Anyway, so, yeah. uh, Sigma, I mean, you, you, you uh, used um, uh, Myanmar as a very good example of how fast access uh, has been created and you know, the number of customers going within 18 months to 15 million or so. Um, you know, how do you how do you broaden this even you know, to, to everybody in, in the region? What are, what are the, the opportunities, but also what are the obstacles to make that work? Well, lots, lot, let me start with what Jasmine is talking about, uh, connectivity. It starts with that. Uh, actually having then broadband networks out to everyone. And, and I think that the, uh, the vision here of all the governments should be to include everyone. Uh, literally everyone. Uh, this is, uh, we should not be happy with 50, 60 percent of the population actually having broadband access. We should be targeting 100 percent. And the only way to do that is to do that through wireless technology. You can forget fixed infrastructure to do that. What I think Myanmar government, and I want to give them some credit there, did right when they awarded some licenses. Uh, they did not go for for a traditional spectrum approach where they're trying to maximize upfront payment. Rather, they went for an approach where they put a lot of obligations to us as an operator. Uh, and the, the license you got was to a reasonable fee, but you ended up with a lot of, of obligations. I would love to invest more in Malaysia, take Malaysia as one example. If I had m more predictability about the future uh, regulations, more predictability than I have today. I would love to invest more if I had a little bit more reasonable um, uh, payment structure when it comes to spectrum, which I need. Then I also would love to take upon obligations when it comes to, to uh, providing uh, affordable services uh, and actually including 100% of the population uh, because you need to make it affordable. 
Uh, in Myanmar, again, some other example, you are not allowed to build your own infrastructure. You are forced through the obligation to share infrastructure, just that the government makes sure that, that you will be able to, to, to uh, provide affordable enough solutions. So it, that's where it starts. And, and I would love to work together with the government to find out how do we actually uh, uh, create connectivity, affordable connectivity to 100% of the population in a business government type of relationship. That, that's where it starts. Then the second part of it is the content part. And again, I would like, love to work together with not only companies like, like Nick is representing, but also the government. How do we, for example, digitalize the government sector in these countries? How do we create digital ID uh, cards for all the population in these countries? Uh, um, take Bangladesh, Pakistan as one example. In Pakistan, we are working together with the government. Every mobile customer in Pakistan needs a fingerprint, a, a thumbprint. Uh, and that thumbprint is then uh, um, uploaded to the digital database that the government has. It's a great asset for a government to really digitalizing the, the, um, the, uh, the government sector. And how do we work together with the government with providing education out to every single village, uh, every single small school? So again, we need to, to, for this, we need to move from big words, uh, digital inclusion, digital economy, digital visions and all that into much more practical uh, relationships and, and more standardized and liberalized regulations. Okay. Um, and now I would like to again turn to, to, to Nick and to, uh, uh, to Emir. I think, you know, you, you uh, depend, of course, or your business depend on recruiting large uh, groups of additional customers and um, as users of your platform, but also as, as, as operators. I mean, what are the most effective ways of, of really reaching out to more people? And where, are the, where do you see the, the biggest obstacles? You want to start? I'll start, okay. Uh, well, I think... Or is it just, you know, it's supply, you know, and you know, everything that you supply you, you is being taken up, so there is no, <laughs> no issue. <laughs> no, but, but, but I think, uh, well, as you know, in the Indonesian population, I think 50% uh, is less than 30 years old, you know, so, uh, so there's very so-called tech savvy. Um, um, uh, we've, uh, our company, we launched it in September, you know, so it's less than a year. But from our, our customers, when, uh, since we launched, you know, we have reached 462 cities. Uh, and out of, in Indonesia, there's only 512. So, so that's about 90%, which is. Uh, but when you look at it, I think uh, smartphones play a, a big role also in terms of because all these mobile operators, I and mean, we got, uh, uh, they, so they, the access is, is, is there and plays a, a big role because I think the more and more smartphones uh, are, are, are being used. I mean, um, so even, even like, you know, even my driver has a smartphone. So, uh, I mean, so, so Indonesia, I think it's, I think a little bit different in, in so, in, in, but on, on top of that, as I mentioned uh, earlier, you know, uh, government is trying to cover everything. Like you said, this broadband is very important. Uh, so they have a plan uh, right now. I think only it's covered the whole uh, Indonesia. They covered only about 80% or something like that. But they say by 2019, it's going to be covered uh, the whole the whole with the broadband uh, because the speed, let's say, somebody in Indonesia, uh, sorry, in Jakarta, uh, versus the speed somebody in Papua, is, uh, I mean, the disparity is so high, it's about 25 times slower. Uh, so, so that's that's a challenge which uh, uh, the minister is uh, doing, the government is doing. Uh, so. Um, it's for us to get access to the to the customer. I think it's a uh, it's a challenge also because of this. But for us, a company, I mean, uh, our name, uh, um, uh, gladly because uh, it's a. If you look at the top ten Indonesian brands, basically, uh, is is Matahari is, is so called very well known even to the uh, small small cities because it's, it's the first uh, department store 
people are used to, uh, to buy from that. So we get the trust. Bear in mind, now, when we sell this, it's basically a trust matters. I mean, you pay, and then you don't, your, your goods will get sooner, will get there or not, we don't know. So, so that plays a role, so that's how, you know, and we've been very happy in terms of uh, accessing, getting the traction uh, despite this nine months. Very good. Nick, so how do you uh, expand reach and richness and interaction? It's a really interesting question and business problem because we have 670 million people in Southeast Asia, including Taiwan, but the viscosity of getting to those people is incredibly high. Uh, there has historically been only one approach that companies have tried, and it's incredibly foolish. You spend gobs of money on Google and Facebook, and you advertise the bejesus out of it. And that leads to a customer acquisition cost for e-commerce in the $20 to $60 range, for digital content in the $15 to $20 range. But it has historically been the norm for people to raise tons of venture capital and then throw those darts, hoping that 1% or 2% convert. We have taken a very, very different approach in our business. And this may be the very first time that we're publicly sharing how we've done it. It is truly one of the most important ingredients in how we've gone from zero to about one in four internet users uh, in our business in this region. Uh, it begins actually with, with mindset. We have a very Asian mindset as opposed to a Western mindset, and Amir will chuckle when I say this. I'll start with just a very simple Bahasa Indonesia lesson. In English, there's only one word for the first person plural. It's we. In Bahasa, there are two words. There's kami, which means we, but not including you. And there's kita, which means we, including you. Most US tech companies, particularly the app developers or the, you know, the Web 2.0 guys, they have a Kami strategy. They put their app on the app store and they hope that someone will download it with lots of advertising. We have a Kita strategy. What I mean by that is in each of our three businesses, each of which is the, for the, economy, the economically inclined, a multi-sided platform, we empower SMEs on the ground in each of those businesses and we pay them very generous commissions to popularize internet and mobile in their local communities. So for our digital content business, we have 70,000 cyber cafes across the region, each of whom are getting paid when people use our product. Not our P&L, their P&L. For our payment business, we have 100,000 points of presence, and each of those storekeepers gets a very generous commission when someone pays for something on our platform. And lastly, for our e-commerce business, we have almost 900,000 SMEs, each of whom are making money when they sell goods and services. That's a Kita strategy, when you make other people money. So we've harnessed self-interest, but also SME empowerment to be able to popularize things at a very rapid clip, as opposed to going to Google and Facebook, no, no disrespect to them, and buying ads on their platform. Yeah, I think it's very interesting because, uh, I mean, Jack Ma, as you all know, I mean, he really pushes very hard um, this idea of a global electronic trading platform. Um, and, you know, his message is we, uh, through digitization, we will enable uh, not replace, you know, millions of people uh, in, in their jobs by machines, but we will enable tens of millions of entrepreneurs to set up businesses and through the electronic platform um, really reach out to customers, but also to suppliers to become much more efficient. And, uh, and, and I think, you know, that's um, an, an important element of, uh, of bringing a positive message. Um, you know, as, as, as you have mentioned about, you know, what you expect the government, hope the government will be doing, as, as you are saying, you know, you enable, you know, whether it's the, the coffee <laughs> places or whether it's the, the SMEs and so forth. Um, and, and I think it's, it's very important to, uh, to use this as, as a big lever to embrace a lot or to include a lot more people in, in the space uh, and, and to make inclusiveness not something like, like a right, but a huge opportunity, you know, very much on, on, on what you said about, you know, you and, uh, and uh, including me or not including me and so forth. So really making sure that people really see this as an opportunity for themselves and, and for their families and so forth. Bagus, bagus. Bagus. <laughs> <laughs> very good. So um, I think let's now uh, turn to the audience and uh, I'm sure you have uh, lots of, of, of questions. Hopefully you have lots of questions. Uh, please state your name briefly and have a brief question. I mean, no long statements, please. Yeah, if I may say. Otherwise, I will impolitely will interrupt you. So, we have. I'm sure we have Mike uh, here around. There, it's Mike. So. My name is Kumar K S Kumar. I just wanted to ask two questions. One is about uh, ASEAN being a a largely rural uh, 
you know, rural part of the country is uh, very large. So what about smart rural? I mean, how is how are we going to do? What is the strategy for, uh, you know, using digital technologies to have inclusive growth, or you know, or digitizing and making rural more smart? Okay, that's one question. The other one is how does ASEAN leverage their talent for global services in the digital environment? So we're looking at smart manufacturing, connected world, industry 4.0. How do you train talent who can actually remotely support those kind of uh, businesses in the developed world? So how do you, what's the strategy to develop ASEAN to be a center of excellence for the future of what digital services could be? Okay. You want to take yeah. this on? Okay. The second question, uh, I think I passed, but the first question <laughs> I'm interested in. Uh, I think the, the idea here needs to be that there shouldn't be any difference between you living in, in a very rural village and you living in Kuala Lumpur. You should uh, have the same type of services, regardless of where you live. And the beauty of, of internet and, and the digital platform is that that is actually possible, because you can deliver the same type of services on a much cheaper platform. So the, the idea should be that every person uh, even in countries like Bangladesh, like, uh, like Myanmar, should have a bank account. It's just that he doesn't have to go to a physical bank branch. He's having a bank account on his mobile phone. He has mobile money. And you could even take one step further. You could do microfinancing and, and, uh, and uh, savings uh, based on that. So you go to your mom and shop, pop shop in the local, very, very rural, uh, remote village, and, and you... And you uh, either withdraw or you uh, deposit cash. Same with health, for example. You don't have to go to a hospital or to a doctor. You can take a picture of your skin disease and you can send it over the, over the air. Or you can have health insurance, uh, again, doing digitally. Same example, education. I can take area after area. So the idea here is that you should have all different types of services should be possible to, to be done in an inclusive way, which actually the whole population benefits. If you do that, then you can really also um, uh, get businesses in rural, rural areas to, to uh, flourish. Yeah. And, uh, and one example yeah. of that. Yeah, one, please. One example of that. Uh, I, I just saw a video from a, a shrimp farmer in Thailand. It's a she. She used to, to go to her husband, uh, went out during the night time and, uh, to, to catch the shrimps, and then she sold in the market the next morning. She actually now put this product on, uh, on Facebook. And she had 10 times uh, uh, increased her sale just with doing that. Very, very simple digital selling platform. And just a very, very small example on how a very, very small SME business actually could, could, uh, could uh, benefit of that. So there is a tremendous opportunity there. But again, then businesses and governments need to work together to make this yeah. happen. Yeah. I think just building on this, on the healthcare aspect, I mean, a few weeks ago I was in Africa and we also talked about digitization of how new technology changes healthcare. And actually, but it was not, you know, the new uh, drug or the new whatever, you know, uh, very uh, uh, difficult or, or sophisticated electronic uh, uh, CT or so, but the issue was, you know, through digital information you can uh, enable teachers to apply drugs to children, for example, against blindness, mm. you know, and, and I think, you know, there is, there is a lot of opportunity, and we always think about big technology, when actually with, um, you know, we make technology as an enabler, or the information as an enabler, and then we use very traditional ways of delivery, just building on that, yeah. Can I respond to the gentleman's second question? Um, uh, I, I think you, you're from Sutherland, is that right? Yeah, and Sutherland is one of many successful companies in India that have done IT outsourcing and business process outsourcing. Uh, I had the good fortune to spend about a decade of my life as a BPO investor in a number of companies, including Genpact. And I'd say the following. I think the failure to build a successful BPO and in IT industry from a services standpoint outside of a six square mile zone in Makati in the Philippines is an enormous failure for Southeast Asia. We have 670 million people, but find me the Infosys, find me the TCS, find me the Genpact of Sutherland. They only exist as branch offices in Makati. That's a huge issue. And when people think about the classic middle income trap, 
you know, bumping past 8,000 per capita, maybe 20,000, BPO ends up becoming a very important part of that. There are over a million people in the Philippines working in call centers, accounting centers, IT centers. I would love to see that in Jakarta. I'd love to see more of that in KL and Thailand and Hanoi. That's got to be a priority. Yeah. Yes, being earlier when we, we sat together, you also said, you know, let's not always talk about the digital economy and you know about e-commerce, but also think about all the other elements of the value yeah. chain. Uh, so exactly. it's so this is this Kumar, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, BPO is uh, for 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 Malaysia. That's how we started, and that is our claim to fame in the digital economy right now. Um, we have uh, 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 all the big companies, the HPs and the Dells and the the uh, HSBCs and all that. They are operating in Malaysia, and we have Malaysia has consistently been over the last 13 years have been ranked in the top three in the area of a, a, a location uh, preference index by AT Kearney for, uh, for shared services. And um, the key to that is, uh, of course, talent. You know, there are, there, are, there are three components in the BPO. First is talent, ease of doing business, and the last one is cost, cost arbitrage. Now, in Malaysia, we have, uh, we are, there's a shortage of talent. Um, you know, as, as in everywhere, especially in the area of ICT professionals. Um, but uh, cost arbitrage is one of the things that I think can be arbitraged across ASEAN in a much better way. So we are losing a lot of uh, jobs to a lot of the call center. We no longer do the call center type of BPO because we no longer have the cost uh, advantage for it. It's going to Philippines. And soon, Philippines is going to have be losing it as well because there'll be countries that will be, uh, 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 you know, that they will have the cost arbitrage. So there is a big opportunity for BPO, and I agree with you, Nick. That is something that, if that is a low-hanging fruit, because it is something that's proven in Malaysia, in, in Philippines, how do we then leverage that across other parts of ASEAN? And there's a very important nuance to what Yasmin is saying, which is, in ASEAN, outside of Manila, and even in Manila, it's mostly been in-house captive shared service back offices for companies. Great source of job creation, great for the economy, but not as entrepreneurial as independent businesses. What India got right, and we need to copy some of that, that secret sauce, is a bunch of private equity firms went around to GE and American Express and others and bought their back offices, slapped on a sales force and created companies de novo. Yeah. We should encourage more of that here where the HP back office and KL or the what have you gets turned into a business that then can grow independently. Very good. But Other Hans, questions? Yeah. Uh, no, uh, Hans, sorry. can I just talk about <laughs> smart, uh, you know, uh, smart rural? Because that is something that I have been trying to pr propagate. We're talking about smart cities, but smart rural is something that, you know, that, 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 can be, that has not been fully spoken about. And there's a big opportunity, I feel, for ASEAN. Now, smart rural, we, we have experimented um, with a smart rural. And, and, you know, apart from the access, which is the enabling component, apart from financial inclusivity, which you mentioned, Sigve, but economic empowerment is one of the most effective uh, drivers for uh, smart rural. And, and I'll share, share with you an example of what Malaysia has done in two areas. One is around e empowering the rural folks for around e-commerce. We have embedded, over the course of last year, what we have done was to really embed e-commerce, and this is using e-commerce, using Facebook, using Google, and we have worked with this private sector, digital marketeers, to really come up with a curriculum that is embedded in all of the vocational schools throughout the country. So we have 413 rural, I would say rural e-commerce centers where the people can go to and they have, we have had successes, amazing success stories, where the revenue of them selling simple things like frozen food, uh, uh, you know, uh, handicraft materials, and in the past they've just been selling within their little geog geographical, uh, what we call the uh, Pasar Pagi and Pasar Malam, night market and uh, morning markets, and through the access of e-commerce using, uh, you know, very simple social media platforms, they have managed to double and tenfold their income. and. Doing, get, getting that kind of mm. income levels in the rural area is very different than getting that same kind of income in the, uh, in the urban, urban area. Uh, area. So that is one part. Agriculture, smart agriculture is also another big component. <laughs> yes, so I'll yes, stop there, Hans, yes. <laughs> Good, please, yeah. Engineer Achievement Asia Pacific. I have a question about how to leapfrog human capital. Because I think one of the most important points that came from the plenary session is education. 
I'd like to hear your thoughts on innovation, on education, so that we can bridge the difference between the digital haves and have-nots, so that young people can benefit from the digital dividends of this region. So who wants to take this on? <laughs> I mean, actually, there, there, is, there is quite a lot of work already being done, you know, how uh, digitization of education is really enabling uh, children and young people to, uh, to move much faster. I think, but it's not just replacing teachers by iPads or whatever, but really uh, combining uh, uh, teachers with iPads and enabling the children and the teachers to do a much better job. I think there's quite, there are quite a number of, uh, of, of studies, including from, from BCG, uh, how to do that. Um, you know, I, but I think that takes, you know, I would say another panel to really dig deep into it. I think, you know, it's, uh, but it's, it's a huge, it's a huge topic also because, I mean, everybody, you know, has been uh, talking about how important, um, yeah. you know, human, building human capital and developing that is uh, in really not just advancing the digital e um, digitization, but also the economies and societies overall. Can I, can I just say something? Nick, you please? No, no, yeah. go ahead, yeah. please. No, I, I was going to say that I am cautiously optimistic about the fact that um, ASEAN, and I'm talking about Malaysia, uh, if, if I can in specific, can leapfrog in the area of human capital. And why I say this is, is from what I have seen. Our youth, our millennials, our kids, I mean, don't, don't talk about millennials even, you know, our young kids, they are digital natives. They are fantastic digital consumers. If you look at any statistics around social media, around the Facebook usage, around mobile phone, uh, uh, smartphone uh, penetration, we are there as users. The key question is how to turn them into producers. Producers, exactly. Producers. And I think the, the kind of, uh, you know, if you look at Malaysia, we are never short of blueprints and roadmaps, right? <laughs> and we have got, and, but I must give credit to the fact that we have got the education blueprint for the, for the, sec, for the schools and the education blueprint for the higher education is really top notch. There is nothing wrong with it. The question is, how do we execute to it? How do you execute to it? Um, in the, for instance, when it comes to universities, you know that we now have something called 2U2I? Two Are you are the Malaysians out there, are you familiar with 2U2I? 2U2I is basically part of the component of the education blueprint, higher education blueprint that says that universities now are empowered to actually do two years in the university and two years with the industry in its various forms. And the two years in the industry is to be credited into that overall degree. So there's no, this about this alternative uh, path towards education. So the policy framework is there. The question is, how do we execute to it? If we get it right, we can leapfrog. If we don't, then we'll be still meet. We'll follow up after the session, please. Let me make, make, make comment about Indonesia, I guess. Um, I think that the challenge that we're facing is right now, you know, uh, we built education, but people uh, who goes to this education is not uh, so compatible to the industry itself. So, so that's, that's one challenge that, that, that we're facing. But, but how I see it also, I mean, connectivity plays a, a, a very important role. You, know, you talk about formal education or you talk about knowledge in terms of making this, uh, our people more uh, so-called knowledgeable. So I guess, I guess connectivity is, is, is quite important in terms of getting all the rulers, you know, they can access internet. I mean, they can ask. Uh, we also, in Indonesia, we say, you don't know anything, you ask what we call Mbah Google. So Mbah, well, I don't know what, what do you say Mbah? Mbah is a... Uh, Let's. Uh, Let's. Yeah. Let's Google. <laughs> yeah, ask Google. So, so, so I think, I think that's, that's one thing. So uh, the government is also struggling in terms of, right now, putting this blueprint and everything, but I, I don't think that is, has a, because it takes time, but the impact is getting connectivity, pe uh, people know, and then we got the millennia, we got the young uh, population. Uh, but also what, what, what right now, uh, trend, uh, uh, there's another issue, it basically being open. Now all, you know, people, uh, the young are very modern and everything. And what, about, what happened about the traditional th uh, so-called uh, things? So that's, that's another challenge which we accept. One last question. <coughs> Um, hi, uh, Andrew Thomas of, of the Ogilvy Group. Um, dis with disruptor companies, a couple of things that, that I always see is that one, 
an attitude to embrace failure and work it into the way they work. But very importantly as well, the organizational structure seems that they have very, very flat organizational structures close to the market, close to customers. Is part of the digital transformation across Asia, is there a need for the big companies of the past that have been a very significant part of, of building the success of Asia, that they need to make a significant attitudinal and structural changes to empower people uh, and, and to allow people, uh, all of those um, individuals, young individuals coming through, to be able to fl flourish uh, in their structure. So that's to the panel. So Sigur, you're probably the, the oldest company, you know, in, in the biggest year. In the <laughs> so how, yeah. how would you the, respond? The very, very short answer to that is absolutely yes. Uh, and I think that it will be, um, there already is major challenges to established companies uh, when these disruptive players come in. And the major challenge, I think, it's very much the way you, you uh, deal with uh, your organizational legacy. Uh, I think Facebook is using the word or organized chaos. So they have they have way of working where where you don't have one boss anymore. You have several uh, that you report to. You work in a cross uh, functional matrix organization. You work in pro projects. You empower your organization. You flatten out your organization. And for big organizations to do that, it's extremely difficult. And that's that's where why I, I think that you see very few established businesses are actually able to, to move uh, themselves into this way of working. And there's been a lot of failures of, of doing so. So, um, and we are in the midst of that ourselves as a telecom player. I think that um, five, six years from now, you will not have uh, what we know today as a telecom operator uh, around anymore. They will be gone. Either they are gone because they, they are reduced to being just a wholesale uh, provider of uh, connectivity. So you are, you are becoming a dumb pipe, that we like to, like to call it. We own the network, Utilities. but we are, are not involved in any customer relation at all and, and not the content either. Uh, and that's a very different business model. Or you have been able to take that decision. And in Telenor today, this is very much actually, it's not about the good ideas. It's not about the investment. Money is easily available today. It's not about that. It's about exactly what you ask about. Are you able to deal with a different way of working? Are you able to deal with more risk taking? Are you able to, to, uh, to uh, have your uh, kind of uh, entrepreneurial spirit in the way you work? Are you able to challenge your own success? Are you able to um, to uh, put uh, stop doing a lot of things? And I don't have any answer to that. I'm really afraid of that myself, being now head of a telecom, uh, a global company. I'm not sure if we are around in 10 years from now if we are not able to do these major yeah. changes that we are up against. But I think you know. I think it's a very good ending because, in a way, uh, I think you're asking the questions that every society in Southeast Asia and around the world, every economy every institution, every company has to ask itself, you know, how do you adapt to that and how do you experiment? Uh, can can I offer a perspective perhaps as, as the, the youngest person on the panel? Um, a bit of a, a, bit of a, a counterpoint, uh, but, but supportive, I think, of what Sigve is saying. Um, if you look at the five to six most successful internet-based businesses around the world right now, and you look at their period of most significant value creation and growth, it was often the case that the CEO, the number two, the number three individual in the business, were in their early 30s, by and large. A few were getting into their late 30s, and they've accomplished great things. I mean, Mark runs a fantastic business at Facebook. Sergey and Larry run a great business at, at, at Google, and so on and so forth. But when you look at larger companies, and you look at the typical 30 to 35-year-old individual, the lack of responsibility, the lack of involvement in client acquisition, in setting strategy, in capital budgeting is, is quite different than in a startup. So part of what I think, and to get to Andrew's point, part of the dynamic we have to think through is how do we give intelligently more responsibility to younger people and organizations who often may be a little closer to the customer, a little closer to the technology shift, a little more empathetic with where the strategy ought to go, but at the same time, give respect and dignity and tenure credit, if you will, to the people that have been around for 20 or 30 years. That's a really important tension to solve. And uh, unless it is solved, you'll keep having young people leave, getting funded by Sand Hill Road, and set up their own businesses to basically empower themselves independently. 
Yeah. So I, I think the key, the key issue of digitization is not the technology. It's really enabling people, uh, taking, uh, giving them more responsibility, as we heard, trying out things, um, not being afraid, but also not being afraid of failing at times. Thank you very much.